Wireless Land Professionals Podcast, Episode 144. Wireless Land Professionals is a place to educate, inform, encourage, and entertain those involved in wireless lands. This Wireless Land Professionals Podcast is an audio manifestation of these goals. Our host is a wireless land veteran, consultant, designer, and teacher, Keith Parsons. And now, the podcast for wireless land professionals by wireless land professionals. Hello, this is Keith Parsons, and I'm today with Jennifer Huber. Jennifer? Hello. And Samuel Clements. Hello. And uh, we're together in um, Tennessee, of all places. Your hometown? Yeah, my hometown. Happens to be the Nianza Conference, and I thought, since we're all here at the same time, we could have a chance to do a podcast and talk about a subject that, uh, last week I was with Jennifer, and we and she, she mentioned something about where her career is today, and I thought it would be a, a nice subject for our, our listeners to to talk through and have us you know, since we've been in this industry for decades, decades. Um, about what, what are some of the different career paths people might take in the wireless line industry. And uh, we've seen quite a bit of it. So I thought we'll start out there. So just to, as a first starting point, Jennifer, how did you start and where were you in the... Oh, my goodness. I was working at a big theme park in Central Florida, and um, I was tasked with doubling the deployment of wireless access points in the park. And I was given the the edict to, to go forth and, and conquer. And if you have any questions, come back and ask me. But the fine print to that was is that every time I asked the senior network admin a question, he answered my question with a question. So nothing was given easily or readily, and you had to stand there at the cubicle and fight your way through figuring out your own problem. Now, did he, well, you, you make yeah. the assumption that he actually knew the answer. Oh, he did. Oh, oh he, well, he did. was just being mean. Uh, making you think for yourself. So it's good. It was trial by fire. Um, so that's how I got started in wireless back with the Cisco 1230 series access points, the little rubber duckies, and doing the um, the site survey heat maps with MS Paint because um, we had no tools. Um, we had the Cisco CB21 AG card for figuring out what the signal strength was and documenting it in paint. Um, and and that, that, that card had a wonderful little switch. You could say, do you want distance or quality? Yeah. <laughs> like, What? <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I got started. A lot of trial by fire, a lot of figuring it out. Um, at the time, there was no formal study. There was no formal way to educate yourself like there is today with books and videos online and study guides and all that stuff just, just didn't exist. And if it did, like in the early days of the CWNP or CWNA courses, I was unaware of it. You didn't, you didn't tie Planet 3 Wireless with... Uh, well, I don't know. This was like 2002, so that was a long time ago. Yeah, that's where I got started. Sam, how did you get started? Oh gosh, back in uh, back in my uh, platform builder days, um, you know, we did uh, laptops, and they had these. Uh, they they were moving from you know uh, card bus and PC card, you know, Ethernet adapters to how do you get these things connected to the network and Wi-Fi adapters, and you know, okay, great. So you put Wi-Fi in this thing. Where does it connect to? And um, it was uh, that was sort of the beginning of of the Wi-Fi career, and then I. I moved uh, to another state and uh, was doing the, the platform building stuff, PC servers, laptops, and we ended up with this uh, pallet of gear. And uh, they said, hey, uh, you, you know a little bit about Wi-Fi, right? And, yeah, hey, go, go learn that. And uh, that pallet of gear was some Cisco Outdoor APs and a controller. And um, that, that, that's where I sort of, that's where I feel like my career sort of got started. And then uh, a round of layoffs later and got on board with another company who was doing these things called surveys using, um, uh, you know, Microsoft Paint or I guess Visio and crayons <laughs> at the time. Um, and uh, and the rest is, as they say, history. Um, so I guess that means I've done it all, the worst of the worst and hopefully the best of the best because everybody's got to come from somewhere. Yep. So if someone was today starting, you know, they're just getting out of, I don't know, Cisco Academy or something, and they have some uh, route switch background or they're coming out of help desk, where do you think they should start? I mean, you, you hire people and you have people who work with you and for you and other teams. Where do you start them? Uh, well, I think the most obvious place to start is if you have a foundational understanding of RF, you could certainly learn how to use site survey tools and uh, spectrum analysis tools and be a field engineer, you know, pl plotting, placing access points, maybe AP on a stick surveys or validation surveys, or the person that collects the data. Maybe you don't generate the report, but you could be the person that collects the data and gets the opportunity to analyze it while you're doing the survey. So that's one definitely option, being the feet on the ground. I mean, that's where I started. You know, once I went into consulting, I was certainly out there with the laptop surveying, you know, miles and miles. Is, is that where you start, guys, today? 
Um, or is that a separate? I, I almost see that as a separate job well, it category. Can be, it can be professional services. It could be that that um, that could be definitely some place to start. I mean, you may get some skills being, you know, a jack of all trades at a business and being tasked with being the wireless person among many, many, many other responsibilities. And that could be a place you could start. Um, the proliferation of gear that's out there now, you can certainly find super cheap stuff on eBay and set up your own home lab and tinker and if it really piques your interest and, and learn on your own, if you don't get the access to it at work. Uh, selfless. Yeah. Shame, shameless plug here. Uh, we have a lending library. If you, on w, uh, sorry, WNPros.com, there's a lending library. We have tons of gear. Okay, probably not literally a ton, but many, a whole s- stores with hundreds of pounds That's worth fantastic. of gear. And you can just check it out <laughs> and use it and learn and then send it back and let someone else do it. That's fantastic. In fact, the only, the only cost is uh, you have to write up a report or at least a, a lab exercise that you learn so the next person can learn from you as well. That's really cool. Uh, so, Sam, where do you start people? Well, I mean, in the industry, I think there's, there's you really have to make a choice. Um, you know, there's really only three, three sort of distinct bodies of people who are going to give you a job, and that's uh, enterprise, it's the VAR space, or it's the manufacturer. Um, you know, I think most everybody falls into one of those three buckets, and I think your entry point into each of those is different, and I think what you do day-to-day is different in each of those organizations. And I think that in the enterprise space, it, it's probably a little bit easier to get into, uh, despite the fact that you may end up with some... Uh, some dry days, if you will, uh, uh, some uh, some boring uh, work, if you will. Uh, most enterprises tend to stay fairly static, um, but those tend to be the ones that, that need the help most. And so those tend to be the ones that are looking to hire and bring people on. Uh, but in, in both of your jobs working with absolutely. Avar, you interface with the vendor guys. Yeah. Yeah. You interface with the enterprise guys. So I think you're in a good position mm-hmm. to, to see what those little roles yeah. are. Like you, like you mentioned, I, I think in the enterprise, being a wireless only is hard. Uh, pr- pretty yeah. rare. It's pretty rare. Uh, so it's, it, yeah, you, it's pretty you, rare. if you really it's like the wireless, you're going to probably have to leave. Um, and like you said, it's, I don't know, boring is <laughs> the right word, but you have one set of gear, can, yeah. one set of environment, and you, you can you own tune that. it as nice, yeah. and you own that, the whole thing. But yeah. moving into a VAR, now you have lots of projects to work on. But you don't have any depth. You don't get to stay around. Yeah, it's very, very true. The enterprise is interesting, though. If you land someplace that does need a wireless-only person and they have so many problems and you learn so quickly and you fix all the problems and then it gets boring once you fix all the problems. <laughs> <laughs> then, then you go to a VAR. And then you, then then you, you go to a VAR, and, yeah. and, you, and you get lots and lots of practice yes. at fixing other people's yes, problems. Yes, exactly. You're like, oh, I've been here, done that. So, I, I've, <laughs> so uh, a friend of ours, George Stefanik, was with Enterprise. And he would start out people, and, and he mentioned he what he wants is to get someone who's just intelligent and has drive, drive. Yeah. and then he, he can bring them up from there. Yeah. So definitely. when you're in the VAR space, what's the kind of, what are you looking for when you're looking to hire? Uh, attitude, not aptitude. Yeah. Is that, isn't that what they say? Yeah. yeah. They, they, you can, you, we have uh, brought people on board who have absolutely tanked technical interviews, um, but they had the right attitude, and yeah. they knew how to articulate what it is that they didn't know. Um, yeah, and, and they were willing to say that they don't know say. a given yeah. thing. Yeah, for sure. Um, you so know, you tanking technical interviews technical. is what you're suggesting? Oh. No, not at all. <laughs> but with panache and skill. With, with, yeah. panache, with yeah. style. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, with a bit of humility. Now, um, the, the, the upthrust of that is that you, you can get into many places uh, without a whole ton of skills, assuming you're willing to make some sacrifices. Yeah. So how can you tell what those, those are softer skills? So what kind of, how, how do you tell in that interview? Is it a question or is it just a, a, like a, a feeling you get? Um, at least where I'm at, it's never one person that makes the decision. No. It's typically a team of folks. And, and, and not to say it's hiring by committee, but there's a certain perspective of um, if you can interface with a team of people in a certain manner or a certain way, and they all pick up on that, or at least most of them pick up on that, then there's, then there's typically some um, coalescing on, you know, this person's going to need, you, you would never recommend not hiring somebody. You would recommend hiring somebody for a role that is a growth style of role. And if you recommend somebody, uh, you know, hey, this person is, is, is not quite where he needs to be, I would recommend he comes in as an associate or, a, you know, an entry-level role or, or, um, or something along those lines. And if that person's willing to sort of take that sacrifice of, of maybe a reduced pay into a job career, knowing that there's growth, knowing that there's a, a plan to say, hey, you know, we see potential in you, um, here's what you need to do, X, Y, and Z in order to... Uh, progress through the ranks. I think that, that having a growth plan and that expectation up front 
is almost more important than going out and uh, quote unquote hiring a rock star. Um, I, I think that that approach can be successful, but those are really, really hard to hard to hard to find. So how, do, how just trying to define what is it that quality of that drive? That, how do you tell when you're when you're interviewing someone? Well, if I ask somebody if they have a home lab. I mean, even if it's just like, even if it's just like a couple of access points or maybe they bought like a, you know, an autonomous AP. If they tell me like the horror story of buying something and being disappointed, you know, that shows some sort of personal drive and in, in, in interest outside of um, it being funded by an employer. Um, and I look for when people talk about team projects uh, to not uh, hear them say we, 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 we. Occasionally I would like to hear the and I did this and I did that and this was the problem that I found and I solved. Because I get that you're a team player, but I'm always kind of leery of the we everything. I'm like, well, what did you do? Yeah, for sure. I, I had an, an interview at one point, and um, the, the the candidate said something to the effect of, yeah, I've been at this enterprise for the past, you know, three years doing, you know, team lead stuff. Oh, okay, great. What did you do? Well, I went on site, and I and I led the team. Okay, what did you do? Well, I, I led. I had meetings. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I led. I told them where to go and what to do. Okay, so uh, and then you you did what? You reviewed the data? No, I, I led. So uh, so sometimes it's like pulling teeth where you have yeah. to where you have to you know really dig in order to find out what that person's been doing with the past two or three years of their life, and if they've been doing nothing but you know leading, um, without really any uh, technical uh, engagement, if you will. Uh, that that's usually not a good sign. Yeah, but it's important for us as the interviewers to find out whether or not they're just uh, maybe like embarrassed to to say what they've done and, or they've accomplished. They don't want to diminish the team. That could be. You need to find out though, as the person asking the questions. But you ask you ask clarifying yeah. questions oh, yeah. to oh, get that. Always. Oh yeah. And it's easy to know. It's easy to identify somebody who's a self starter. Uh, it's easy to identify somebody who says. Oh, I, I was doing fill in the blank, or I ran into this problem, and 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 this is this is how I went and tackled it. Uh, maybe not at my day job. Maybe I I, I decided I was going to go home, or maybe I decided I didn't know what I didn't know, and so I went out and bought a book, and and I and I learned about this CWNA thing, or I learned about my vendor of choice has an associate level test, and I'm I'm studying for fill in the blank, and and this is how I'm studying, not yeah I'm studying someday I plan to get a, a CWNA. N- no. Or C- w- C-N-A-W. So, yeah, yeah, or, uh, yeah, yeah. I've heard that one before. Nice. Um, so when people come in, you, you assign them a role. What would be, the, what would be the, the trigger that lets you know they shouldn't just be that entry level that this going to be on a growth plan, but they're up the scale a little bit? What, what's a trigger that says they're now not doing that minion level work, but something you could send them off autonomously on? I'd say everybody is different, and, and I'd say the, the warning sign that I, that I see, I'm, I'll, I'll answer the question in reverse. How do you know somebody's not ready? Um, the warning sign that I see sort of in reverse is somebody that comes on board and says, okay, I've got a, I've got a growth plan. I want to be a, I'm going to come on an associate. I want to be a senior network engineer, then an architect, and I'm going to do this in these number of years. In order to hit this milestone, I need this certification and this certification and this certification. They tell you that during the interview? You, you, you sometimes have a dialogue with people in order to understand where their head's at. Um, somebody who's looking for... Uh, growth based on cadence and based on milestone. Hey, if I get 10 projects under my belt and I get my CCMP wireless and my CWNE, then I expect a senior role making this number of dollars. Th- those are warning signs where you say y- you, you're expecting a, a gated conversation. And once you pass X milestone, you're going to get fill in the blank. Th- there's more to professional growth than just certs or just projects. So that's how you don't do it. So, so what, what, what could a candidate say or explain that they have experience at to say, yeah, I, I, I could send this guy off on his own? He's, uh, he's not a minion guy. He's, you would never send a candidate mm-hmm. off on their own for, first, first shot out of the gun. Yeah. You, you, I mean, well, well I mean, you, you sometimes interview jobs that aren't for the entry-level jobs. Oh, for sure. But, but, but regardless, you still have an onboarding process. You still have a... It's a back and forth, uh, you, yeah. you pair somebody up with a senior resource, yeah. regardless of where they're going, um, to make sure they don't go out and do something stupid. I think that <laughs> a consistency in a VAR is always a challenge. And one of the ways you mitigate... Um, inconsistencies um, is by having these tagalongs, these uh, these growth programs, these cultivation programs, and procedures. Yeah, no. Yes, and and part part of that is can this candidate follow procedures? Uh, yeah. Well, certainly. Yeah. Um, from your role as a, in the VAR side, you see and interact with uh, the vendor community, and they also have wireless LAN roles from SEs or sales yeah. or support. Um, 
What are some of the roles that you've seen there and, and what kind of people fit in those categories? I'm terrible at remembering people's job titles. Well, not just Help the titles. What do they do? I well, mean, there's, I mean, there's, there's that whole SE. There's SE role, yeah. yeah. SE, and, and then there's like technical marketing engineers, and then there's like, those are the people that are good at talking to slides. The SEs are your people that you go to and you find issues that aren't currently documented to run them up the flagpole and find out what the problem really is. Well, that's if you have SEs that have more E than S. Yeah. That's and a there's fact. a bunch that have more yeah, S than E. Yeah. Your mileage may vary. And and TMEs, I've some of the best guys I know in the industry are mm-hmm. TMEs. Yeah. But then there's also the slideware guys. Yeah. Well, it's not necessarily a bad thing to be yeah. a good in presenter fact, uh, slides. Lee Badman's Syracuse has put out quite a few really good TMEs. TMEs, yeah. It's almost like they're like I, they have a career path to go that route. Well, I think that career path may be just a a hey, you were a, a CSE or you were a sales engineer or you were a, you know a whatever. And we really like what you do and we want to give you more money and we want to keep you happy and we want you to do more of that stuff over there. It's, it's maybe an escape route out of the doldrums of the uh, CSE or the, the SE world. Doldrums. You make it sound bad. <laughs> <laughs> not, not a jaded perspective if, at all. If, it? <laughs> if, if you liked it, you'd already be in that side. Right. So, right. Yeah. Uh, but there's, uh, I, there's a lot of guys who, who I, mean, I know guys who've been SEs for a decade, yeah. which is kind of the for other sure. topic is... Some people stay, and like I was talking to you, Jen, you you don't do that field work anymore. Yeah, I don't. I, I so, don't, what are yeah. some of the other options where people can move? Well, there's lots of different ways you can go once you um, either come to the realization that you've done enough site surveys, like you've walked enough million mile buildings. There's, there's enough. You, you kind of get to a point where you're like, oh, yeah, okay, this is not as challenging as it was at the beginning, and you're like, you know, ready for something a little more stimulating. At yeah, first, you have to walk five hundred thousand miles, Literally. and then you have to walk. 500,000 500 miles more, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, there's lots. Of, you can become the person that uh, is the leader of groups and in, in, uh, empowering others to, to be leaders um, with you know, regards to being the, the technical engineer on a project. Um, you can do like internal training on products or solutions or um, like uh, one of the things that I do is I'm in charge of the mobility VT calls. So therefore I either present or I get other people to present or I open it up to the field to, um, any of the engineers that we have within the company, if they want to step up to the plate and talk about a project that they've encountered issues with or, uh, lessons learned, or if they're excited about some solution that they found out about, I give them an open platform. And that's how you find out who your internal leaders are. The people that are like, yes, I will take this opportunity to do some public speaking you know and, and are willing to risk and, and and try something a little bit different um and, and what are the different skills needed to do that transition well um i mean have you, do you ever meet people that that's their goal i want to be no well those, right. the, i mean they, i mean, I, they, I mean they make themselves known like maybe you don't <laughs> find that out because you're not looking for it but when you right. give the opportunity you're like oh cool I want to hear what you've got to say. That's exciting that you stepped up to the plate. Uh, the, the flip side of that coin is I've had, uh, uh, in the industry, you talk to people from a variety of technologies. And I've, I talked to uh, um, one person who was on the, the collab side of the house. And, and his comment was, I can't wait to get my CCIE that was, so I don't ever have to put another phone on the desk. <laughs> and, and, and I think that there, there's a disconnect there from an expectations yeah. perspective. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, in, in that I, I absolutely go out and do surveys um, yeah. still. Yeah, um, I mean, I could. And, yeah, yeah, for sure. I wouldn't say I wouldn't, but no, I just, I'm not the person that's putting might, out fires anymore. You might get a cherry pick a goal. really cool stadium or, that you haven't got to do yet. Or well, yeah. or they put me into a project because um, a customer is like on the on the bleeding edge and they're really upset and they know that, you know, if they put me on it, everything seems to be okay when they put me on stuff. For sure. But, but I don't, I don't know that you, I don't know that you made a conscious decision in your career at some point to say, man, I'm done with surveys. I'm I'm never going to do this anymore. No, opportunities presented themselves. And I just kind of went away from being the the field engineer because I have, you know, a natural aptitude for sharing information and finding ways to share information. So that led to, you know, internal training videos and one thing leads to another and they're like, oh, we could, you know, multiply you by me having you make these recordings to explain stuff to everybody. So, you know, you not being in the field is not a bad thing because we're getting more out of you because you can train, you, you know, 15, 20 people at a time from recorded videos that you've made. So you both train. You both. Was that ever a conscious decision to say, I need to go no. learn how to be a trainer? It no. Just kind of yeah. slid in. Yeah. Are, is it a skill that everyone can learn? No. No. Well, <laughs> y- you have to be quick about thinking on your feet. And I, I, I like to, um, 
I, I think that I'm pretty good at making analogies so that people can understand what I'm talking about, even if we're not speaking like the same technical language, like it can relate it to something you already know so that the light bulb goes off. And I don't know that everybody has that ability. Well, and you have to be willing to learn from your oh, students. Oh, for sure. Um, I, I, I mean, if, if I had a, I was in a, I was teaching a class not too long ago. You'd have a lot of nickels? I, I would have a whole lot of nickels. Um, you know, a student said something along the line, you know, a student asked me a question about some topic and, uh, you know, you have to be willing to say, I don't know, I will find out, I'll get yeah. back to you, or here's what I think it is today, and then have a dialogue and realize that maybe you still thought you knew something that was probably wrong, or that may, yeah. may have been wrong. You have to be able to uh, admit that you were wrong, um, and you have to be willing to know that um, you're always learning. Yeah. Jake Snyder posted something about always learning about Someone who's that he respects, the, who's intelligent, who has strongly held beliefs that will easily change them. Mm, not, mm, that that you're you're like I really believe this, but you're also as soon as you find evidence to the contrary, if you find evidence to the contrary, you go yeah. okay, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I was wrong. Yeah, for yeah, sure. there, there's there's nothing yeah. wrong with being really sure, and as long as you don't get stuck. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, it's yeah, the stuck course. part. I every every month I find new things that someone teaches me that's like. I had no idea, and hey, that makes a lot more better sense. Yeah. So, what, where's the future then? If not, not just for you personally. I mean, in the industry, if I go back twenty years, I wouldn't have thought we would still be talking about eight or eleven basics, and yet we do. Man, I still think that we need so many new field engineers. So, there's, every time that we hear a company present, it's like, wow, they we we need there's we we're sorely lacking in new wireless engineers. I think there's a lot of them that are you know, have access to resources now that, that wasn't around when I was a, a wee pup of an engineer. Um, but it still is very clear that there's a lot of FUD out there that we need to get rid of. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the uh, you said it yourself. You had, uh, yeah. you and I had a chance to listen to Eric over at Aruba yeah. j just a couple months ago. And then you said something to the effect of you, he had done the same presentation but several years prior to and you had missed seeing it. And, 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 and that's not a, um, a, oh, you missed something. But I think that, that as the industry, there's so much data for us to consume that there's no way that you can draw a line no. in the sand and say, oh, okay, I, I now know everything that there is to know that, that Eric said because I heard him talk once. No, the reality is, is, that, is that as trainers and as educators, you sometimes have to say the same thing yes. over and over again because there's always somebody there who hasn't yet heard it. And I think that that's almost just as important as being able, being willing to grow is you have to be able to be repetitive because th there's always going to be somebody who doesn't know why you should turn off one and two megabits per second data rate <laughs> or, or, or not. Are you supposed to? It depends. <laughs> I said or not. Oh, okay. <laughs> it depends. It depends, yes. Um, and so I think that, there, that that's an interesting um, uh, dynamic, which is we sometimes as trainers feel like we're repeating ourselves till we're blue in the face, and sometimes we are. Uh, but there's a reason why we're doing that is because there's always somebody there who maybe hasn't heard it before. Exactly. And so if people are going to benefit from what it is you're saying, keep saying it. Good. I, I, I agree with those. So where, where's the, if, if you start as a field engineer, minion, you're out on the, you know, walk around doing those pieces, you might be doing installs, uh, support, then you move doing configs and you got projects of your own, you move into leadership roles, train, internal training, um, what are the other places that people can go in this industry? You could go, you know, to be an engineering manager. You can retire. You can retire. You can start your own company. <laughs> and we do know people who left the yeah. industry. I, I don't understand why, but some people have left yeah. Wi-Fi. Yeah. yeah. Um, and photography. I mean, really. What's up with that? <laughs> Nicely done. Uh, yes. Yes, yes. There, there's like probably 12 people in the world who got that. Exactly. Got that. But yes. they're laughing yes, hysterically. They it's okay. <laughs> Um, I, I mean, I think there's there's always uh, there's always uh, places to go and uh, things to see, and that's and that's from a career perspective. Uh, it's from a location perspective. You can, if you're willing to travel and go, and there, there's a certain job role for you, right? You, you want to go travel, see the world. There there is there is a Wi-Fi career for you. You don't want to travel, see the world. You want to be in a leadership role. There's a Wi-Fi role for you. Um, and 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 it's. Um, I mean, I know that I almost sometimes feel like I accidentally fell into where I'm at today. You did. Uh, but if you you did, so I did. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I feel like I didn't give my didn't give my career a lot of direction. I just felt like I like I ended up there sometimes. Um, but if you have an opinion about what it is you do or don't want to do, um, d define a path, but don't be so black and white about it that, that you stop 
considering other alternatives. It kind of goes back into that that cadence based. It's not based on that. It's based on opportunities and whether you can take those opportunities when they when they very much show so. up. Good, good information. Um, so, what's the future for you personally? Oh, for me personally, like not work related. No, 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 work related. Um, where do you want to go? Well, where do I want to go? I mean, are you satisfied? I mean, oh, I'm totally satisfied with what I'm doing now. But I mean, if I was given like a nudge to, you know, go one way or the other, as long as it was still in the mobility space, I'd be totally okay with that. So I'm, I'm definitely open to opportunities and, and, and shifting, but I definitely want to stay in the Wi-Fi space in general. Not that I've been asked to like leave it or anything, but no, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Sam, practice manager, Sam. Uh, retirement. Oh, no. retirement. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I love my job. I, I, I could, I could write a, a fictitious job that, that, that is your, that is my dream job. And you know, ninety eight percent of what I do today would, would be in that job description. Well, actually, I love yeah. your job. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Why? Thank you. I, I, I like yours as well. Uh, uh, no. Um, so I, 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 I certainly don't ever want to put myself into a corner where I say I, I'd never want to do anything else again or I would never want to do something different because the, the role that I'm in is sort of built in um, growing. You have to stay on top of technology. You have to stay yes. in front of technologies, uh, tools, training, enablement. You have to stay in front of industry trends, and, and that's not a static job. Um, I, I, I would never want to say that. But, but there are those. I saw a bunch in our conference today who – that's they, they they actually are the same guys who are SEs 10 years later for the same vendor they're happy they're doing that maybe they have to stay up sim- on their current technology yeah. but not necessarily yeah. the broader scope yeah maybe it's simpler if you work for a vendor yeah. you just have to stick to what your vendor does and evangelize it and but from a var standpoint you have to there's yeah. so many vendors i mean not just in wireless but all the supporting pieces and the well, and even VARs that, that focus on one vendor, you, you look at a typical manufacturer and they've got systems engineers for uh, retail, systems engineers for manufacturing, systems engineers for enterprise. You know, the, the, even within a typical manufacturer, you're going to have SEs that, that only need to know their product in their vertical as a VAR. Even if you focus on one manufacturer, you have to focus on that manufacturer in a bunch of different industry verticals. And then you overlay multiple manufacturers on top of that, or multiple manufacturers within a single manufacturer, uh, and 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 the problem just compounds itself. Uh, there's there's no shortage of positioning and learning and enablement and bug fixes and feature releases and and blah that you have to stay on top of. So I guess in to finalize here, if you want to stay up on this industry, um, you, there's no um, you're on a treadmill. There's yeah. no if you stop, you For go sure backwards. Not. Yeah. So you got to stay on. But that's why we love it. We stay at yeah. it because it gives us something to learn. Well, Absolutely. thanks for your time. I appreciate yeah. your talk. You. And how would someone track you down, Jennifer, on social media? Oh, you can find me on Twitter at Jennifer Lucille. Um, I also blog at JenniferLucille.com about Wi-Fi. Um, and where um, could they see your yoga training? Uh, yoga training is at GentechYoga.com. Uh, Twitter, GentechYoga. I'm also on the YouTube. So I've got audio classes in Spotify and iTunes and Google Play. Free. There you go. Sam? And I, I'm nowhere near as prolific. Uh, <laughs> uh, on Twitter, I'm at Samuel underscore Clements, and I blog at sc-wifi.com. And it only took me like 10 years to realize what the sc.wifi meant. So, yeah. Yeah. And if you don't get it, realize you might be smarter than I am. So thanks for your time, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. 10 Talks. Hello, everybody. My name is Jason Hintersteiner, Emperor Wi-Fi on Twitter. For those of you who follow me on Twitter, for those of you who don't follow me on Twitter, why aren't you? Uh, The talk this morning is Wi-Fi the wrong way. When you don't have the luxury of deploying Wi-Fi the right way, I run a boutique consulting company called Imperial Network Solutions. Uh, If anybody's interested in Wi-Fi consulting services, come talk to me. I only have 10 minutes, so there are certain things that I'm not going to be able to talk about today. Uh, First is, I promised Keith I wouldn't use this word, so I'm not going to. Second, I'm not going to engage with Devin on a debate about 2.4 gigahertz. Uh, And third, uh, I'm not going to talk about this. I talked about, but come to CWNP Wi-Fi Trek in the fall, and you might hear a little bit more about that. What I'm going to talk about is the fact that it's 2018, but the world's still designing Wi-Fi like it's 1999. Right? The industry has invested over 20 years in telling people how easy it is to deploy Wi-Fi. 
right? But the demands on these networks have increased exponentially since we started deploying Wi-Fi in the late 90s, right? The nice to have has now mission critical. Design for coverage is replaced with design for capacity, right? In short, Wi-Fi technology is much more complex. And we, that means that you have increased sensitivity to bad settings, bad placement, just bad fi. Right? We used to be more robust to this in the early days. We're not anymore. So good Wi-Fi design becomes absolutely essential. But it isn't just out of ignorance that we're deploying Wi-Fi the wrong way. Right? There are plenty of industry resources out there for Wi-Fi engineers. We've encountered them here this week. There's CWMP, there are blogs, there are conferences like WLPC. Vendors have best practices which are actually surprisingly consistent from one vendor to another. Right? Vendor-specific certifications that kind of enforce those best practices. The Wireless LAN Association. Right? There's no excuse for ignorance in this day and age. But we still deploy it the wrong way, and even experts deploy it the wrong way from time to time. So why is that? Sometimes we have to. We don't have a choice. So why don't we have a choice? I'm a systems engineer by background. Before I got into Wi-Fi, I was a systems engineer. So I'm a requirements geek. I like knowing about requirements and constraints. So let me walk through a little bit about the requirements of Wi-Fi and the constraints on Wi-Fi. Requirements are what the network has to achieve. So when we talk about requirements on any network, we're talking about usage. What kind of devices are using the network? How are they connecting? How are they getting authenticated and so forth? We talk about coverage. What are the areas of the facility that need to have signal? What kind of signal strength do they need to have? What kind of overlap do they need to have? Capacity, how many simultaneous devices do I have to be able to handle on the network? Are there areas of high client density versus lower client density? I have to worry about control. So how am I gonna monitor this network? How am I gonna manage the network? How am I gonna make sure it's actually working over time? And then finally, it's not just the Wi-Fi access points, right? What's providing power? What's providing backhaul? Do I have, have to worry about my switches, my cabling, if I've got to do point-to-point -point or point-to-multipoint backhaul, right? All of that has to be folded into those requirements. Now, ideally, these requirements are solution neutral and they're independent of each other, right? The types of devices I need to deploy, where I need to deploy them, how many of them I have to capture, right? Ideally, those should be independent of each other. And also, they should be solution neutral. They should not actually depend on what vendor I'm using or how I'm actually going to do it. But then I have constraints. And constraints are the things I have to work around. Limited budget, limited time to implement, aesthetics, the external RF environment, what kind of noise I have in the environment, limitations in being able to run ethernet cabling to where I want to run it to, dictates, to use particular AP vendors and models. Before going out on my own, I worked for a particular vendor for over two years as an SE. When, solution, when problems came to me, I had to use their equipment. Well, sometimes their equipment wasn't always the most appropriate for the problem, but that's a constraint. Many times you have a lack of information about the facility, and sometimes you have lack of access to the facility. So these constraints are very solution dependent and they are highly coupled to each other and to the requirements. So what happens when you have too many constraints? Right? I'm showing the belt and suspenders. Right? I only need one to keep my pants up. Right? But here I've got too many constraints. What happens is the constraints drive the design. They don't, not the requirements. You want the requirements to be driving your design, but instead the constraints are driving your design. You're gonna satisfying the constraints becomes your design goal, not actually satisfying the ultimate requirements, which is what you really are targeting. It may become impossible to satisfy all of your requirements, especially simultaneously. Unfortunately for us in this industry, the over-constrained scenario is actually the common one. That's the one that we tend to work to every day, not the nice ideal one that we read about in the CWDP book. So how do we actually design in these cases, which are the real practical cases that we encounter in the world. The fundamentals are still fundamental, right? So when we're doing a design, there are really four knobs that I have to turn. 
There are four fundamental things that I have control over. I can pick what IP vendor I use along with what model. And if it's a model with external antennas, I also have some choice to, to go to my antenna partners and talk about what antennas I slap on those APs. I have control over where I put those APs in the facility. I have control over what channels I use on those APs on each band, and I have control over the transmit power, how loudly I allow those access points to talk. Now, we all know that these parameters are not independent of each other, and they require iteration. If I'm moving APs, chances are I've got to change the channels to adapt. And if I change the channels on one, guess what? That's going to propagate to changing the channels on the neighboring ones, which propagates to the neighboring ones. And before you know it, I've changed all the AP channels in the entire facility. Now, over constraints generally limit your degrees of freedom for at least one of these, if not more. So what are some common over constraints? First is, I can't put the APs where I want them. Now, why might that be? I might have a limitation in being able to run Ethernet cabling to where I want it to go. I might have aesthetics. Nobody likes seeing APs. Recommended solutions. Think a little creatively. Think a little out of the box. Directional antennas. I love directional antennas. Just talk to Smitty, who's here in the room. He knows how much I love directional antennas. Um, if I'm limited in where I can put APs, put the APs there, use directional antennas to actually get the signal where I want it. Mesh, I hate mesh. I, I've debugged way too many mesh networks in my time to actually like mesh, but mesh actually works in certain circumstances if you design it right. So use mesh capable APs for applications where I really can't get wiring there and where performance is not absolutely critical or it's really more coverage driven versus capacity or performance driven. Think about also, if this is gonna let me go back, using wireless backhaul. I'm a big fan of point to point and point to multipoint. I've even used point to point indoors to, to decouple my access point providing Wi-Fi versus my access point providing backhaul. Think about using wireless backhaul, point to point, point, no, point to multi-point solutions, your wireless wire. Budget, another common constraint, just don't have the money. What does that mean? Lack of access, right? Can't do pre-deployment or post-deployment site surveys because nobody wants to pay for it. You might need to go with fewer APs or less expensive APs. Possible solutions, predictive modeling. In many scenarios, predictive modeling is good enough. Right, yes, it's not perfect. Yes, it's based on many simplified assumptions, but very often it, it actually can be sufficient. Um, again, though, if you're gonna rely on predictive modeling, the more information you can get out of the property, the, the better off the predictive model is gonna be. The, the worst predictive modeling scenarios I've encountered is where the property doesn't give you any information or very inadequate information. Be wary of leading edge. Let's be honest, 802.11n is actually quite sufficient in many design scenarios, especially in the SMB world that I work in. But even in some enterprise environments, 802.11n is perfectly fine, right? I don't need to go with 802.11n AC wave two for most scenarios. Um, mix and match vendors hate it when I actually suggest this, but I've actually done this in my WISP days where I use higher end APs from one vendor in the high capacity areas and I use cheaper lower end APs from another vendor in the coverage areas. I've used this a lot in hospitality. Finally, and I know I'm running a little over time, radio resource management. Remember I told you two out of your four knobs were channel and transmit power, but lots of installers are perfectly happy to seed half of their design knobs to software. Let the APs kind of figure it out themselves with RRM. Every vendor does it differently, and let's be honest, some vendors do it better than others. I have yet to encounter any vendor that does it right, and we've certainly had those debates. RRM usually breaks down in very complex scenarios, AKA over-constrained scenarios. Turn it off. Use static channels, especially in complex over-constrained areas. Use your 1611 in, in alternating patterns, same on the five gigahertz band. Let the external networks adapt to you. Don't worry about adapting to them. It's your network. Let the other people around you adapt to you. Do static transmit power also. Turn down the power. Make sure there's a power offset between 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. In conclusion, it can, it can be done. Over-constrained scenarios are commonplace. 
We usually don't have the luxury of deploying Wi-Fi completely the right way. But you can still create good Wi-Fi designs. It's not an excuse. Understand your requirements. Understand your constraints. Think creatively. Don't over-constrain yourself. Pick the right AP for the job. And use all the design knobs that are available to you. And acknowledge that the right way may not necessarily be the way that you have to apply in this scenario. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Wireless Land Professionals Podcast. The podcast for wireless land professionals by wireless land professionals. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at Wireless Land Pros for all the latest news and updates. And also connect directly with Keith on Twitter at Keith R. Parsons. Head over to www.wlandpros.com for this episode's show notes, as well as the latest in all things Wi-Fi. 